Uh, good morning. Hey, look at me. I just entered on the swan stage. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I've never done that before. I shall never do it again. Uh, good morning. I'm Anthony Lilly. Um, I am whatever it says. I'm a director of a, a commercial theatre business called Scenario 2 um, and with uh, my business partner, John Berry, the former artistic director of the ENO. Uh, and um, I'm digital media professional by long-term background as well as theatre. Um, I'm Professor of Creative Industries at the University of Ulster. I'm here because I'm AHRC Council member and was involved um, in putting together uh, the bid that, that delivered uh, the, the, the programme we're about to talk about today. Um, I'm acting as MC um, during the course of the day, introducing people uh, in a little bit, um, talking through um, with some colleagues from the floor um, some of the issues that hopefully arise during the course of the morning. Uh, I'd like on behalf of um, AHRC and uh, myself to do an enormous thank you, to say an enormous thank you to the team here at Stratford. This event's been put together very quickly. Um, the team who look after these events for, for us at, at Innovate and the AHRC have done an amazing job of it, but it's impossible without the help of the partners. This, we didn't have the swan until Friday afternoon. Um, it's been put together brilliantly by the team here and they've, they've done a lovely job. So thank you in advance for looking after us. Thank you in advance for the opportunity to come and, and talk about the future of performance here, um, which in a, in a space which is both uh, the past and the future of performance. If you don't know it, Sarah Ellis just told me that the floorboards that are holding up the seats you're sitting on are the stage of the original Royal Shakespeare Theatre. So the floorboards were once trod by Olivier, which is rather a wonderful and glorious thing to know um, before we set out talking. So um, my job first is to introduce Professor Andrew Chitty, um, who is the Interim Challenge Director for the Audience of the Future programme. He's going to um, take you through what this is um, and a lot of the sort of background to it and a um, certain amount of the logistics. And then as the morning progresses, we will we'll then um, have some people, as I say, up on the stage um, and we'll talk about some of our responses to, to what Andrew has said and also um, some thoughts. Um, the objective of the day is essentially to get you to meet each other, to get you to think about the possibilities of what I think you'll, if you don't know already, you'll, you'll, you'll rapidly learn is, a, is quite a large and extremely um, unusual and hopefully timely intervention in the creative industries uh, around research and development. Um, it, the, we're not trying to pick anybody's brains and take ideas away. We're not trying to um, um, determine at this point what is a good idea and what's not. It's all about an open um, conversation and exchanging information and sharing it with you. Um, that said, the deadline's August the 1st. Um, so there isn't an awful lot of time to just ponder. So we're on it. There's real money. There's real time. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. If you've come a long way to Stratford, as many of us have for a Monday morning, and I hope you have a productive day. So with that, Andrew, who is somewhere, Andrew's going to come up and take you through what the programme is. So thank you, Professor Andrew Chitty. Okay, th uh, thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, so as Anthony says, oh, I, I rejoice in this title of Interim Challenge Director for, for the Audience of the Future. So what I'm going to do is just do a bit of scene setting around where this comes from, because this is a... Uh, I suppose a doubly new initiative. So it's because it's the, the money's coming from the industrial strategy. It's not coming from uh, from from what you might call arts or cultural funding, um, and it's also the first kind of R and D funding of its type that's coming to the creative sector through through this competition. So, um, as anybody actually, as anybody know who was, who might have been listening to the day program this morning, uh, Sam Jimer, the, the the relatively new minister, uh, was talking about the role of the industrial strategy. It started really um, kind of in the, in the kind of public presence uh, just over a year ago. So in January uh, last year, um, the first projects were announced. And um, the idea of the industrial strategy is to um, strengthen and through the industrial strategy challenge fund, fund research and development and innovation in key sectors of the UK economy going forward. So, so the very first announcement, so there's a big uh, support for, for the automotive sector. Uh, and particularly around uh, uh, green tech and batteries. Um, again, the first announcements a year ago, so we had remotely piloted vehicles, robots, robots that solved the problems of the oil and gas industry. And there have been lots of money uh, and lots of initiatives announced around uh, biomedical science and, and pharma. So these are the kind of classic, what you might think of as classic um, research intensive uh, sectors of the economy. The kind of things where there's a well-known pipeline of funding fundamental research then into applied research, industrial research, and out of the end of it comes some, uh, some economic benefit. But there wasn't in that first phase uh, anything that was announced around the creative industries. And so 
um, the context for uh, Audience of the Future it is partly has been a quite long journey to get innovation in the creative industries uh, recognised as, as both appropriate for this funding and, of course, the, the creative sector is a key part of the economy. So the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, as I say, is um, it's about identifying key sectors and uh, supporting them to transform, emerge or grow. Uh, it's trying to have uh, built around challenges so every project that's funded through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is a challenge-based uh, project rather than being a generic, uh, a generic R&D fund. And there's a key, there's, there's, there's a focus on economic benefit, but also within that on productivity and new skilled jobs. So that's the kind of overarching framework we're working in. As I said, initially there wasn't, in those first announcements, there wasn't anything uh, devoted to the creative sector. Uh, that's now not the case. Um, at the end of wave one, um, the industrial strategy uh, made the decision to commit to what's become the Creative Industries Clusters Programme, and I know various people in the audience are, um, are involved in these clusters. Uh, so at the moment, we're just at the stage. This is a, an £80 million investment in eight R&D partnerships um, across the UK uh, between universities and industry. Some of them are focusing on particular sectors. Some of them are focusing on a range of sectors within a geographical location and at the moment we had 22 on our not very short short list uh we will be uh, we're actually i there's no particular secret is it that no. the, the panel's sitting this week to take that down to 12 and then uh we'll fund eight and hopefully those will be appointed at the start of the year um and one of the key things that that, that helped clusters get through was the growing idea following peter bazalgette's report uh, in, into the creative industries that clusters were a key uh, focus for economic growth uh, within the sector. But also within Baz's report, um, the other thing that he drew the attention of, and I think very effectively in central government, was that there's one key technological advance that offers both opportunities and threats for the creative sector, which was around the new experiences and content experiences and formats enabled by immersive technologies. And um, Anthony and I and Tom Fidian from Innovate UK had been working through an idea about what we could focus around a challenge for the creative sector around immersive. And it was really helpful that Baz came up with this and particularly helpful because um, what Baz pointed out is that this isn't an investment in technology, is that actually the opportunity for the creative industries, we don't as a sector, and I'm a recorded content person rather than a live performance person, but we, we sell experiences. We sell, we sell bums on seats, we sell subscriptions, we sell uh, royalties uh, from IP. And it's actually what we needed to do uh, to, to meet the challenge of um, these immersive technologies was to look at the commercial and creative outputs that pull through technology innovation rather than just looking at technology innovation. So that was very helpful. Uh, that Baz um, set the scene for that and also pointed out that if the UK wants to con continue its, um, its great success in a lot of these areas as we adapt to uh, immersive technology, we need to both be able to create content, so in the kind of IP generating sense, but also create a skilled production workforce so that we can remain uh, or even grow further um, in terms of drawing in uh, investment from around the world to, to invest in, in, in content made here. So um, it was announced in the industrial strategy in the, uh, in, in the autumn, uh, the industrial strategy white paper, that this, the audience of the future was one of the new, uh, one of the new challenges. Uh, and we'd got at that stage 33 million pounds. There was an asterisk there, um, which said 33 million pounds probably. Well, actually it's 33 million pounds actually. Um, although it has to be said that if, uh, and, and been talking to Sir John Kingman, who's the chair of uh, UKRI, and ultimately um, the person who will kick our butt if, uh, if we don't use this money wisely, that actually, as well as the authority within UK Research and Innovation to pull the plug if we look like we're spending this in a slightly mad way, they also reserve the right, if we look like we're delivering success, to reinforce what we're doing. So there is an opportunity here, if we can move quickly uh, and, and show the progress that we're making um, 
that there is an opportunity to, to expand on what we're doing. And that's very much the ambition because this and the clusters program, as I say, are the first time that innovation in the creative sector is seen within a, within a large scale project on a par with pharma, with engineering, with automotive. So I said uh, that they were all around a challenge. So this is actually the challenge statement. So this is what, we're, this is what the objective that we're trying to achieve is is to capture new global audiences and grow our leading market position in creative content products and services by adapting, exploiting and developing immersive technologies. So you see the formulation is, um, first of all, the content enabled by the technology. So uh, I think that um, is really a new departure, but also sets the tone for particularly what we're trying to do in the demonstrators. Um, we've got some other metrics. Um, that within, is that seven years now? The clock always done these things counts down from when you wrote them. Um, that we're a global market leader in a creative immersive sector, so that's the overall. Uh, and that we might get to a stage where um, the immersive content sector in the UK is, is producing 10% of global immersive content in that period. Now that's not a completely bonkers ambition. 20% of the global box office last year for film was UK produced films. Um, so we're setting, what we're trying to do is set achievable targets uh, so that um, with the success and excitement that we generate around this, uh, we can look for this to be the thin end of a wedge uh, of creative R&D funding. Um, so the other thing is that having, uh, having formulated these two propositions and, and audience in the future particularly, it's become central to the, um, to the creative industries sector deal that was recently signed with government. In fact, uh, of the 150 million in that, about 100 million of the investment the government are making in the, in the creative industry sector deal are these two R&D uh, funding streams. So what was our rationale um, for the um, putting funding into this area? Well, the first thing I, was that the immersive technologies, and we, we, we could have a long debate about that and I'll perhaps um, give an indication on our thinking on that, um, that they're potentially as dis these technologies are potentially as exciting and positive and disruptive for the creative industries as the web was uh, in the mid-90s. In fact, having gone through that with my own company, um, setting up a company and in that period, there are lots of similarities about not knowing quite where the knowledge lies and the requirement to collaborate. We don't know who the winners in this are going to be. It's going to be a lot of the people who are going to be involved in these competitions, though they might come out at the end of it in different formulations. Um, but it is disruptive and exciting, but that's that also brings with it opportunities and threats. So currently we're fabulously competitive as a knowledge and IP creating uh, economy, but also as a production centre. But that could change. We don't, uh, none of the dominant hardware or platform operators are UK based. All of those ex-UK immersive platforms and, and technology leading companies are looking for opportunities in content. So if we don't seize this, they will look elsewhere and create a new supply and, and production chains. Um, and the important thing, again, this, was, this is obvious to you guys, but wasn't immediately obvious to everybody in government, is that the oppor commercial opportunity, which is what the industrial strategy ultimately is about, the commercial opportunity for the UK creative industries is through the experiences enabled by the technology and not by the technology. So, um, as I said, it's, it's central to the creative industry sector deal, which is great, brings a certain degree of attention to it. Uh, and when we've been talking to the kind of, with the Creative Industries Council and the, and the various other industry bodies, there's a high expectation around this programme of what it's going to do. And one of the things is to de-risk investment. So the idea that we can use this funding to identify or test viable audience propositions and business models. So a lot of uh, the larger commercial um, and media companies in the sector have said, everybody's looking at immersive and dabbling or funding innovation projects, but the thing that locks up investment at the moment or holds back further investment is not really knowing what it is that would delight and entertain audiences. And without that, you can't build a commercial proposition around it, and without that, you can't invest. So, so what we're doing is, this is risk funding in new models of uh, audience proposition uh, content, or as the term I prefer, experiences. The other thing that came out was innovation in production tools and reskilling the workforce. So if we want our major creatives to be able uh, to utilise these technologies, think about creating 
work and adapt it within their own practice, they have to understand and be exposed to this. Uh, and that's a key, key element of what we're trying to do in this programme. And we also need uh, tools so that the production methodologies and the w production workflows um, can become more efficient, more effective and, and less high risk in many ways. And the other thing I think that's important for us as a scene setting thing is that um, we need to do this. We need in industry engagement across the value chain. So again, this is very similar to me to the web in the mid-90s. This isn't just about specialist companies uh, who are skilled in using these technologies at the moment. So yes, we need the specialists in uh, AR, VR, XR, MR, anything ending in R, but we also need everybody else. So, you know, and this is slightly different according to which sector you're in, but we need the people who produce the content, we need the IP owners, the brand owners, the audience uh, brand owners. Uh, we need the hardware providers, we need the platform operators. We do need to take the investment community along with us, that would be good, uh, and there's a lot that we can do about that. And we need whatever is going to pass for distribution uh, and exhibition uh, in this chain. So that's obviously slightly different in the different, in the different sectors we're looking at. But we think to do big things in this, we need that new knowledge and the innovation to run across uh, all that um, value chain or production chain. So what are we actually doing? So we've got, we've got um, 33 million pounds of grant funding in the programme, um, 16 million of it, so half of it is going into the demonstrator programme, uh, which is what we're here to talk about today, uh, is how uh, we could formulate concepts for demonstrators in, 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 in the performing, uh, performing arts and performance sectors. Um, we've got 12 million pounds into, into collaborative R&D, so these will, be slightly, these will be smaller projects, but still quite chunky. Um, and we've got five million pounds into an industry centre of excellence. This is specifically around the problems that the screen industries face. So just to unpack that a bit more, um, the, the demonstrator programme is undoubtedly the biggest, uh, the most risky, the most high profile, the most risky, and the most ambitious. So what we're looking for is a small number of very ambitious content innovations, so new experiences, um, collaboratively produced at a pre-commercial stage. So things that advance the state of the art and test those with audiences at real scale. Um, somebody said to me, we all know what a 100 grand or two, even a 200 grand project looks like in this area. Do we know what a 5 million pound project looks like? Um, and so we're thinking of large collaborations across the supply chain. Um, the CRD programme, we're breaking into a number of different fields. So we're also at the moment, simultaneously, as launching the big, massive, risky project. We're doing uh, a, a, a small um, design foundations competition so you can look at small propositions um, tested uh, with audiences and with um, design and creative companies across the sector. Um, we'll be devoting a, a significant fund into uh, the creation of production tools, making um, the production wor uh, workflow more accessible and faster. And we'll also, later in the year, possibly early next year, be looking at an in investment accelerator model. So this is bringing in, using public funding to bring in commercial investment side by side in single companies. And as I say, the, the industry centre of excellence is about talent development and experimental production for the screen industry. So it's really looking at that high-end talent conversion and learning by, by doing with experimental production. Of course, we say the screen industries, but I defy any of us, uh, as, we, as we try and set up these demonstrator briefings in different sectors, to actually identify firm boundaries uh, between them. Uh, and that £5 million industry centre of excellence is going to be delivered in, in partnership with the clusters programme. So it will be docked with one or more of the winning clusters bids. Uh, and that's, I think that's a very good way of doing it. Half, probably half of the cluster bids that we've received in, uh, that within that shortlist have a strong emphasis on, um, on immersive experiences anyway. And the other reason is because we asked for a lot more money for it and we didn't get it. Um, so um, the thing we're all gonna talk about today uh, is, the, is the demonstrator program. So I'm just gonna, just gonna run a little bit through that and then, and then Tom and I will take some questions on, uh, on, on the uh, on the competition itself before we head into the main main event, which is thinking about how this applies in performance. So um, one other thing about Audience of the Future, as well as having very risky elements and having this 33 million pounds of public money, um, 
It's actually a bigger program than that because of the uh, match funding that's required uh, to be brought into the space. And I'm sure Tom will be delighted to take questions on match funding in a bit. They don't let me out to allow me to um, take technical questions on match funding. Um, but the important thing to note from this slide is not so much the number, which is big, it's the timeline, which is short. Now, in a more sensible world, this wouldn't be the case. But this is a world where the comprehensive spending review and things and the Treasury dictate how and particularly when we spend the money. So the big pressure for this is actually going to get the money out of the door and spending it fast enough. Um, so as you see, we've got to spend some money this year, a significant amount. But over the next two years, as these big projects roll into uh, development and production and testing, we really, really have some very hard timelines to meet. So. What is the demonstrator program? So um, again, we've got a rationale. Starts again with the thing that this is about innovation in content because that's where the ultimate opportunity is. And as I've said, that investment is held back currently by um, the lack of clear audience propositions, forms or formats. Now, there are plenty of people in the audience who could take issue with that because they've all done brilliant things. But across the sector, um, I think, the, what the new forms are, how this can ultimately become a, a, a revenue generating or audience generating model is still, uh, is still questionable, largely because it's still pre-commercial. So we're applying this stuff, but outside the performance space, say in the moving image space, most of the good work that's been done in immersive is actually being done to promote other things. Um, it's demonstrators, it's promotional material, it's experiences that are released alongside a major movie. They're not generating audiences for themselves, they're generating it for existing forms. So overall, we think that, that, that that's the reason why at this stage, to take this and test it at scale, it justifies public investment. And you could do that in lots of ways, but the, re the, the way we've decided to do it in this, in this program is through a series of large-scale pre-commercial and collaborative experiments in content innovation. Um, so the idea is that we have to innovate in content to reach a large enough audience at scale to provide sectoral learning. That's very important to us. We're talking about a small number of projects, but we do what we're trying to encourage is projects that by the, the consortia or partnerships that are developing them can de develop learning across the sector. So what are we talking about? We're talking up to 16 million pounds. Um, we anticipate we could fund four projects because the maximum we're allowing you to ask for is four million. Maybe we can fund a few more than that. Um, but at the moment, we really would like to see propositions at very uh, significant scale. And we've identified four sectors or areas, or I'm supposed to call them themes, um, in which we think that there's the maximum opportunity um, uh, of getting the return we're looking at, the creative return, the technological return, and ultimately the commercial return. And those are performance, so this is the first one of these sector meetings that we've had. Moving image, sports entertainment, so think sports broadcasting, but immersively, uh, rather than sports itself. And visitor experience, so museums, galleries, but also theme parks and commercial visitor experiences too. And, and what we're doing in all of those areas is looking for projects that can sig significantly advance the state of the art in three ways. Creatively, so for the audience proposition, technologically and how the, the, the technology is deployed, and commercially in terms of thinking, providing data about how we can build viable and sustainable uh, models uh, across the sector. So uh, just as a sense of everybody means everything, lots of things by immersive experiences. So there are immersive experiences that are right across the production uh, chain. So there are audience experiences that are immersive and there are audience ex experiences that are enabled by immersive uh, technologies or new technologies. So, you know, there's things in the film sector, things like gravity, but also uh, motion capture. Obviously, I uh, couldn't come here without the obligatory uh, reference to The Tempest, a fantastic production, but where, again, that was an element of both performance and production. Uh, but the, the, the experience for the audience is almost a mile away from a headset type experience uh, that we're often constrained by. We've got people like 59 Productions using a mix of technologies. Uh, right, this is from the opening, uh, the, the, the Spitfire, Power Brenton uh, play for the opening of the New Southampton Theatre. So how you mix and meld these, uh, these, these into a overall experience is within our uh, field of play. 
We've got um, augmented reality, so it's worth bearing in mind that every, all the financial projections about the impact of immersive technologies say, yes, it might look like VR at the moment, but augmented realities or mixed realities are ultimately uh, where the action is. So this could be augmenting spaces like museums or art galleries or, or, or augmenting um, the real world, as it were, with, with cultural or creative or, uh, or data experiences over them. Uh, obviously, we've got sports. There's been, I think, in the build-up to this, there's been uh, quite a lot of uh, attention around uh, the Formula One, a, you know, a sport that's largely based in the UK, but of course not owned in the UK anymore. But what could that be like as, a, as an experience at home? What is the home experience? This is a piece of work done by Rewind for Red Bull. So thinking if you were sitting in your home with HoloLens visors, what would be the experience that you might have? Um, we've got content that's natively created in immersive experiences. So I don't know if anybody's seen it, but the Hold the World, which is the Natural History Museum's piece with David Attenborough, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very beautiful, very complete. It's, it's a different experience. It's not trying to be an in-museum experience. But we've also got experiences that are immersive because they are enhancements of, of, uh, of traditional media. So things like uh, secret cinema. Um, Walk through game like experiences, like this is the void. I, again, I would recommend anybody who hasn't tried the void to try the void. Please do take some small people with you because the, um, the, the mapping of small people into small stormtroopers is, a, is an absolute delight within it. Um, or experiences that we haven't kind of seen. So, this is, this is a piece uh, by Alec Mac Alex McDowell, who's advising us on the program. Uh, a flying a whale through an audience of thousands of people at CES a couple of years ago. Of course, the whale isn't really there but people could see it through their devices. Um, and it may involve the creation of new spaces to experience this in. This is BDH's, uh, so John Durant down in Bristol's, they did a Magritte piece with the Magritte estate creating a VR experience, and they decided that actually to take it to its, uh, take it to its obvious conclusion, they had to create uh, obviously a large hat within which to experience it so that you could have a communal experience. So they're all within our scope. Um, the scope of the competition is, as I said, it's got the, the overall scope is new audience propositions with three levels of innovation in them, creative, technology, and, and commercial. And many of you will, will always be uh, looking at all three of those intertwined. Um, but we've got some rules. We've got a few rules um, which, which we think are helpful. Um, the first of which is when we say you've got to reach an audience, we've actually put a number on it. And that isn't a typo, so it is 100,000. Uh, from my experience so far of talking to, uh, to, to people interested in the competition, they divide into, I thought there'd be a spectrum, and there just seem to be two ends. That's bloody impossible, and that's very, very easy to reach 100,000 people. Um, it will be interesting for us uh, to see how you describe 100,000 people and describe an audience and how you think about capturing data on that audience. You can't just meet them. You can't just film them. You can't just, you, you know, they have to be an audience that you have some, some interaction with. Um, as I say, the other rule is, is you've got to look at how you transform the sector with, with one of these large investments. And we think that to do that, you'll not need to bring in uh, various skills that don't necessarily sit uh, within even uh, a small number of companies. Um, and we're looking at you, wanting you to demonstrate the, uh, the scalability and the insights. So there's a, there, there is an angle of this, is how are you going to capture data to, to generate insight? Definitions, as I said, we've got a pretty um, broad definition of what immersive experiences are. Um, again, they're not defined by the technology, but they're obviously mediated or enabled through the technology. And our, uh, our defini definition of that technology is as expansive as it can be. So obviously, the, the normal virtual mixed or augmented realities I think haptics plays differently into different sectors, if you think of those, the different sectors uh, that we're looking at and encouraging proposals and demonstrators. Some of them, like visitor experience, I think there's some very, very obviously very exciting things to do with haptics. Um, but we would, you know, we'd be interested in everybody's ideas uh, in, in any proposal around introducing that and similarly advanced uh, uh, visualization. And then, so what is our scope in the performance theme? Um, Again, I, it's, this is, at this stage, what we're trying to encourage is you 
to define what it is. So um, obviously, the, you know, we, we, it's beholden on us to have some kind of definition of what performance is. So creative works, entertainment experiences, we're performing arts at their core, you know, the, and the core performing arts. But how you do that, how you mix them together, I think you, the, the you know, the sector knows what performance is. Um, I think the sense of being co-created as an experience with an audience seems to me one that, that, that people feed back as, as, as central. Um, we are interested in propositions that explore immersive pro uh, technologies in production and consumption. Uh, that could be either. It, it, it might be more interestingly both. Uh, and we're particularly interested in propositions that are relevant across different disciplines and a wide range of concepts. So, so we're not putting all the eggs into creating one great experience that a few people learn from and doesn't have any uh, ongoing impact in, in, in terms of the sector. A um, few other things. So eligibility. Um, and this is where we're straying very definitely in, uh, into the territory that Tom, uh, Tom will take questions on. So you can claim for up to four million. So that's the grant. Four million in grant. Uh, but we'd expect your project to be significantly larger than that. And indeed, it has to be larger than that because of the match funding requirements. Uh, and the state aid requirements that we're working to. So uh, we'd expect total costs of a project to be between five and 10 million. Um, we're not going to say no if you can bring more money to it than that, of course, uh, but just to set expectations, that's where we are. Um, anybody who's gonna lead a bid has to be a UK registered business uh, and carry out the project work in the UK um, and intend to exploit the results from the UK and that everybody has to, every project, every bid has to be a collaboration. You choose your collaborators, but obviously we are open to the collaborators being any form of organisation that is either a business, a cultural institution, an HEI or a research lab from, you know, from the university research base, an independent research organisation or a research technology organisation, which is the, 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 the um, hard sciences version of that, or a third sector organisation. There are no rules that are um, constraining, we don't believe, about who you bring into your collaboration. But your collaborations must include at least one SME by the European definition uh, for, the, for the state aid rules. Um, there are also some bids about, um, we recognise that the sector's in different places, so uh, any one business can lead only one application. We don't think it's sensible on the ludicrously short timescales that Anthony alluded to, to be trying to lead more than one of these. Um, to put together the proposition. Um, if you do lead, you can partner on two others. So non-leadership, again, is to try and constrain you from, uh, from, from diluting efforts. But if you're not leading, you can be a collaborator or partner on any number of them. And so particularly for those creative technology companies that work with many of the different disciplines, we think it's important that they're not entirely constrained uh, by attaching themselves to uh, a limited number of propositions. Um, so funding is available. You see the four million's gone up to five. So funding is available for projects with total costs of over five million. Maximum grant you can have is four. And then how that works for any of you who haven't done, this is going through the Innovate UK funding model. So business led, the 10 questions for any of you who have done it will be the same. Um, it's classified as industrial research. So different people get get funded at different, um, at different intervention rates. So if you're an SME at 70, sorry, if you're a smaller micro at 70%, if it's a medium business at 60%, and if, it's, if you're bringing in a large company, hurrah, that would be excellent, they can only receive 50% of their, of their project funding. Um, so do bear in mind the difference between the total project costs and the grant application. Um, for, for other organizations, so universities, so any university partners are funded in the normal way. So they're funded at 100% of their costs, subject to being 80% FEC, which means something to universities and nothing to anybody else. Uh, and it really isn't worth going into. Um, the only other constraint is there's a maximum of 30% of the grant can be spent with uh, universities. So this is very much uh, a, a business-led operation. Um, Public sector organisations and charities, they can be funded at 100%, but there are constraints. So they must be doing, what they do is they must be doing research activity and dissemination of the project results. Um, 
And the important thing there is also, for those organisations, you've got to draw a clear distinction between this funding and other funding from, uh, from other public sector bodies or public sector funding. So there are, there are technical things there. Obviously, there is an Innovate UK team who, through this process, uh, can provide support. We ex I expect, I don't know if we expect, but I expect there will be a lot of uh, propositions into audience of the future uh, across the various activities that are led by organisations who have not um, undertaken this kind of funding before. So we're very keen that we are there to support you. Um, timeline. Uh, so as Anthony said, uh, the deadline is 1st of August. And for anybody who hasn't done a, an Innovate competition model, the deadline is 12 noon, always. And it really means it. I'm sure there are other people in the room who have had their colleagues or, or themselves submit things at 12.01 due to a timing difference and found that they have wasted the entire uh, effort in, in developing a proposal. Um, so we'll then assess over August. We'll invite to interview um, right at the start of September. And then we'll turn this, we're aiming to turn this around very quickly because of the, the deadline on the end for actually spending the money. So we expect to notify people by the end of September. Projects must start by the 1st of November. So this is an interesting, you know, this is a thing about starting to spend the money. Uh, obviously, that's not a problem for anybody in the room. I'm sure that the spending the money is, um, is, is, is the relatively easy bit, but it does mean a very compressed spin-up time in terms of getting, the, getting the, um, the wheels rolling. And there's always a problem in these big projects of wheel spin. So, uh, but that's because we've got to complete by the 31st of December 2020. So your timeline for your project and the tests that it's going to do with its audience and the manifestations, however marvellous and however many places, all have to take place before the 31st of December 2020. So you've basically got 2019 and 2020 to do this. Um, that's it, really. I mean, the rest of it, the, the, the rest of the morning will be much, much more interesting than this, but that's kind of set where we've come from, what we're trying to do, how you get the money, and um, if we've got time, how are we doing for time? I don't know, but we've got 90 seconds left of the rest of the morning, which is a good result. Right, okay. It's got to be interesting. <laughs> um, so we've probably got time for five or ten minutes yeah, five, uh, of, of questions. Tom, do you want to come up? Because anything that's difficult, I, as always, will throw to you. <laughs> Um, so is there, is, is there any questions on um, the competition, the concept, before we then go on to then Anthony's going to take us through how this might apply in the performance area? No, obviously I killed you with PowerPoint. I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, we've got... A Hello, Emily Smith from Alchemy VR. Um, so I had a question about the match funding. Um, presumably you've got a of people that might fall into it's kind of going in and out isn't it so when you mention match yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah as soon as you mention that as soon as I mention the match funding you've trained your guys to turn yeah. it off um, so you've got a mixture in your consortium of all of those kind of people research organizations yeah. small commercial companies publicly funded companies when you put your bid together yep yeah. Do each of those companies or organisations need to be matched at those levels? Or does the lead partner define the level of matching that the grant is capable of delivering? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I actually got that just the other day. Uh, so basically for each partner that's in the consortium, uh, we pay them directly. So everybody gets the match at the level prescribed to the size of the organisation, because if not, then everybody's project would be led by a small organisation with lots of large ones at the back end. Uh, and also it means that there is no issue with money flowing through one organisation to another. It all comes direct from uh, Innovate UK. Yes. Hi, I'm Annette from the Royal Opera House. Um, I was interested in the timeline and the level of research that needs take place over it. Does the research spend itself and the outcome of the research process also need to fall in the uh, end of 2020? It's the data crunching often takes six months away from the actual process. Do I have a go at that? Do you yeah. Want to, yeah, yeah, I'll have a go at that. Um, so, uh, I th so, what, so what is the hard deadline? The hard deadline is spend the money. 
It literally is because... Uh, so you may have evaluation outputs that you want to do if you're doing talking about that kind of research, evaluating the results. We would obviously uh, prefer it if you had those outputs within the time scale. Uh, and you may, as an organisation like yourselves, have ongoing evaluation that isn't drawing down this funding about the impacts of the research. But I think, um, substantially, the project has to be spent up by that um, deadline. You'll have noticed that that deadline, as a very smart audience, is not the end of the financial year. Tom? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah just to re reiterate. Uh, you know the you know the carriage turns into a pumpkin at the end of that financial year, at the end of that deadline, and there's nothing we can do about it. So if you are overrunning, then that's a hard deadline. So you can fund your own research, but you will not be won't be able to receive any more grant funding. But I have to say that we we argued this all the way through government. So you don't have to worry about this sector because they're used to deadlines and they're used to putting shows up on time, and it always works. And they're going, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so just the research bit's the problem. Okay. One more, Darren. Oh, Microphone to. Really on the side. Yeah, do, if, it's, if the shorter way is through the stage, do you know? Um, 100,000 um, people. Does, does that need to be kind of measured and delivered within the five to spend deadline as well? Or is there going to be a, a period after the spend where while it's going out to the show or something? Because then you need to essentially do the project and get it up and running and show them depending on what it is earlier than three years or you should do the lifestyle. Yeah, I, so the question that from 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 Darren is um, do we have to re do you have to reach the hundred thousand audience within the timeline of the project? Yes you do. Um, and I think that one of the things that inevitably we looked at in this is in the proposal is how are you going to do that? So one model I think immediately everybody thinks of is you're going to end up with one, you're going to culminate this two years with one, you know, sort of massive event or that may not be the way to do it, I think. And I think, so how you approach that. But yeah, you are going to be assessed on whether you, there is a credible path to reach 100,000 people before the, in Tom's word, coach turns into a pumpkin. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Great, we'll come back. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Can... So try and mend the mic in the middle of that. Thank you yes. very much, Thank, Thank you. you.